Okey diyoruz. En son ne oldu? Kvot'un e, tuition'ları yaklaştığı için para bulması lazım. İyice panik moduna geçip olabildiğince çok fazla işte çalışıp para kazanmaya çalışıyor. Fisher'i de aslında güzel para yapıyordu ama fark etti ki Fisher'de yaptığı işler aşırı tehlikeli. En ufak bir yanlışlık kendisini hasta edebilecek kimyasalların vücuduna temas etmesi sonucu çok ciddi hastalanmasına falan sebep olabiliyor gibisinden Fisher'i bıraktı. Müzik yapıyor yapabildiği kadar ama bir şekilde istediği miktar para gelmiyor. Kumara bile bulaştı uşak yine para çıkaramadı falan. Elindeki olan para bir talent, üç jot gibi bir şey. En az on talent'a ihtiyacı var. Çünkü Manit bize açıkladı. Geçen bölüm dedi ki sen artık realer oldun. Realerlerden fazla para alıyorlar. Üstüne üstlük Emrose yüzünden iki kere hocalar duruşmaya geldi. Hocalar sana kıl olduğu için sana ekstradan para Paraya sebep olacak bir tüyüşün miktarı sunacaklar falan. Bir de bir şey daha vardı sanki aklıma gelmeyen. Neyse 10 talent bulması lazım. Ama şu an bir talent'ı var. Bu durumda ne olacağını göreceğiz. Tamam oradan bir şey demeyeyim. Onun dışında ne oldu? Manit, Sim, Willem, Quot 4'ü beraber iyi yayına gittiler. Quot şimdi çalacak. Ama geçen bölümler bayağı bir muhabbet ettiler. Ne bileyim, yurt hakkında konuştular, atlar hakkında konuştular, kadınlar hakkında konuştular, okul hakkında konuştular. Genel böyle. Bu ilk kısmıydı. İkinci kısımda Kvot Dena'yı gördü. Dena başka birisiyle takılıyor. Bu sefer takıldığı kişi Dena'ya harp çalmayı öğretiyor. Kvot geçen kitabın sonlarına doğru Dena ile konuştuydu. Sen harp çalarsan daha iyi olur. Cırt cırt falan. Dena da senin tavsiyeni dinliyorum şu an dedi. Sonra bunlar yine birkaç yedi kelimeli cümleler söylediler birbirlerine falan. Önemli bir şey olmadı. En son bölüm bitti. Nerede bitti? Kvot sahneye çıkarken bitti. Şu an Kvot çalacak diyoruz. Durum bu. Başlamadan önce diyecek bir şey var mı düşünüp geliyorum. Okey diyoruz. Chapter 6. Love demiş. Stand chill, let me on to the stage and broad out and armless cheer. Then he walked to the front of the stage to chat with the audience. I spread my cloak over the back of the chair as the lights began to dim. I laid my battered loot case on the floor. It was even shabbier that, than I was. It had been quite nice once, but that was years ago and miles away. Other leather hinges were cracked and stiff, and the body was worn thin as parchment in places. Only one of the original clasps remained, a delicate thing of worked silver. I'd replaced the others with whatever I could scavenge, so another case sported mismatched clasps of bright brass and dull iron. But inside the case was something else entirely. Inside was the reason I was scrambling for tuition tomorrow. I had driven a hard bargain for it. And even then, it had cost me more money than I had ever spent on anything in my life. So much money I couldn't afford a case that fitted properly and made do by padding my old one with rags. The wood was the color of dark coffee, of freshly turned earth. The curve of the ball was perfect as a woman's hip. It was hushed echo and bright string and drum, my lute, my tangible soul. I have heard what poets write about women. They rhyme and rhapsodize and lie. I have watched sailors on the shore stare mutely at the slow rolling swell of the sea. I have watched old soldiers with hearts like leather grow teary eyed at their king's colors stretched against the wind. Listen to me. These men know nothing of love. You will not find it in the words of poets or the longing eyes of sailors. If you want to know of, of love, look to a trooper's hands as he makes his music. A trooper knows. I looked all at my audience as they grieved slowly still. Simon waved enthusiastically and I smiled in return. I saw Contrap as white hair near the rail on the second tire now. He was speaking earnestly to the well-dressed couple, gesturing in my direction, still campaigning 
on my behalf, though we both knew it was a hopeless cause. I brought the lute out of its shabby case and began to tune it. It was not the finest lute in the Yulian, not by half. Its neck was slightly bent, but not bald. One of the pegs was loose and was prone to changing its tune. I brushed a soft chord and tipped my ear to the strings. As I looked up, I could see Dana's face, clear as the moon. Moon geldiğine ne dedik? Moon'un olduğu yerleri özellikle dikkat edeceğiz. Bu kitapta bayağı önemli olacak çünkü. She smiled excitedly at me and wiggled her fingers below the level of the table where her gentleman couldn't see. Yani böyle bir el mi sallıyor? Not sure. I touched the loose pack gently, running my hands over the warm wood of the lute. The varnish was scraped and scuffed in places. It had been treated unkindly in the past, but that didn't make it less lovely underneath. So yes, it had flaws, but what does that matter when it comes to matters of the heart? We know what we love. Reason doesn't enter into it in many ways. Unwise love is the truest love. Anyone can love a thing because that's as easy as putting a penny in your pocket, but to love something despite to know the flaws and love them too. That is rare and pure and perfect. Okay, şuradaki şu kelime seçimleri falan. O kadar gerçek İngilizce ki böyle o kadar o kadar güzel noktalara dokunabiliyor ki falan. Şu paragraf, şu paragraf very good. Stanchion made a sweeping gesture in my direction. There was brief applause followed by an attentive hush. I plucked two nose and felt the audience lean toward me. I touched the string, tuned it slightly, and began to play. Before a handful of notes rang out, everyone had caught the tune. It was bad weather. The tune shepherds have been whistling for 10,000 years. The symbols of simple melodies. A tune anyone with a bucket could carry. A bucket was overkill. Actually, a pair of cupped hands would Managed nicely, a single hand, two fingers, even. Aklıma ne geldi? We will rock you. Okay, şu an müziği çalmaya başladı. Şu an kitaptayım ben de böyle. Hani birden okuması daha da kolaylaştı falan. Ne demeye çalışıyorum? Hani bir şekilde kitapta müziği anlatırken, kitapta o esnadaki karakter müzik çalarken falan, resmen cidden müzik dinliyormuş gibi hissetmeye başlayıp, Müzik dinlerken bir şeylerin güzelleşmesi gibi güzelleşme gerçekleşmiş oluyor. Mesela şimdi bir yere gidiyoruz. Böyle hiçbir şey dinlemeden gitmek var. Bir de müzik dinlerken gitmek var. Müzik dinlerken bayağı bir sarıyor oraya git. Mesela o kadar sarıyor ki ben sırf bir sürü yerde yolu uzattığımı biliyorum. Bir yerlere giderken sırf müzik çok sarıyor diye. Hani şu an müzik dinlerken kitabı okumaya başlamış gibi hissettim kendim. Hani normalde böyle bir şey yapsam kitapla okuduğumu anlamam. Ama şu an kitabın içinde müzik başladığı için müzik dinlerken kitabı okumaya başladım ben de. Very good. It was plainly said folk music. There have been a hundred songs written to the tune of Belvedere. Songs of love and war. Songs of humor, tragedy and lust. I do not bother with any of these. No verse. Just a music. Just a tune. I looked up and saw a lord. Brick Joe leaning close to Dana, making a dismissive gesture. That in Aletti, the Shale Dias, Hawk Musile. I smiled as I teased the song carefully from the strings of my lute. But before much longer, my smile grew strained. Sweat began to bead on my forehead. I hunched over the lute, concentrating on what my hands were doing. My fingers darted, then danced, then flew. I played hard as a hailstorm, like a hammer beating brass. I played soft as sun on autumn wheat, gentle as a single steering leaf. Before long, my breath began to catch from the strain of it. My lips made a thin, bloodless line across my face. As I pushed through the middle refrain, I shook my head to clear my hair away from my eyes. Sweet flew in an arc to pedal out along the wood of the stage. 
I breathed hard. My chest working like a blouse, straining like a horse, run to letter. The song rang out, each note bright and clear. I almost tumbled once. The rhythm faltered for the space of a split hair. Then somehow I recovered, pushed through, and managed to finish the final line, plucking the nose sweet and light, despite the fact that my fingers were a very blur. Then, just when it was obvious I couldn't carry on a moment longer, the last chord rang through the room, and I slumped in my chair, exhausted. The audience burst into thunderous applause, but not the whole audience. Scattered through the room, dozens of people burst into laughter instead, a few of them pounding the tables and stomping the floor, shooting their amusement. The applause sputtered and died almost immediately. Men and women stopped with their hands frozen mid-club as they stared at the laughing members of the audience. Aklıma şey geldi. Acaba şu an bu videoyu izleyenler içinde ve bayağı müzikten anlayan insanlar var da ne bileyim direkt böyle ne hissediyorlar falan bir geldi öyle. Yani cidden böyle basit bir müziğin, melodinin aşırı zor bir melodiymiş gibi çalınması olayı bana çok yapılabilir bir şey gibi gelmiyor. Mesela hani böyle gerçekten müzik yapan ve iyi de yapan Birisi bu videoları izlerken ya da bu kitabı kendisi okurken ne bileyim alkışlayan tayfa gibi hissedecek mi kendisini? Now women stopped with their hands frozen mid-club as they stared at the laughing members of the audience. Some looked angry, others confused. When you were playing offended on my behalf, an angry mutinings began to ripple through the room. Before any serious discussion could take root, I struck a single high note and held up a hand, putting their attention back to me. I wasn't done yet, not by half. I shifted in my seat and rolled my shoulders. I strummed once, touched the loose peg, and rolled a fortress into my second song. It was one of aliens, that an alien did music tanrısı gibi bir şey bu zor diyoruz. Tintata tornin, I doubt you ever heard of it is something of an oddity compared to Ilian's other works. First, it has no lyrics. Second, but it's a lovely song. It isn't nearly as catchy or nearly as catchy or moving as many of his better known melodies. Most importantly, it is perversely difficult to play. My father referred to it as the finest song ever written for 15 fingers. It made me play it when I was getting too full of myself and felt I needed humbling. Suffice to say, I practiced it with fair regularity, sometimes more than once a day. So I played Tintata Tornin. I leaned back into my chair and crossed my ankles, relaxing a bit. My hands strolled idly over the strings. After the first chorus, I drew a breath and gave a short sigh, like a young boy trapped inside on a sunny day. My eyes began to wander aimlessly around the room, bored. Still playing, I fitted in my seat, trying to find a comfortable position and failing. I frowned, stood up, and looked at the chair as if it was somehow to blame. Then I reclaimed my seat and wriggled, an uncomfortable expression on my face. I'm çok, çok, çok şerefsiz lan. All the while, the 10,000 notes of Tintata Tornin danced and capered. I took a moment between one chord and the next to scratch myself idly behind the ear. I was so deep into my little act that I actually felt a yawn swelling up. I did it all in full earnest, so wide and long that the people the front row could count my teeth. I shook my head as if to clear it and dot at my watery eyes with my sleeve. Through all of this, Tintata Tornin tripped into the ear, maddening harmony and counterpoint weaving together, skipping apart. All of it flawless and sweet and easy as breathing, when the end came, drawing together a dozen tangled threads of song. 
I made no flourish. I simply stopped and rubbed my eyes a bit. No curl sandal, no bow, not a thing. I cracked my knuckles distractedly and leaned forward to set my loot back in the case. This time a ladder came first. The same people as before, putting and hammering at their tables twice as loudly as before. My people, the musicians, I let my bored expression fall away and grinned knowingly out at them. The applause followed a few heartbeats later, but it was scattered and confused. Even before the house lights rose, it had dissolved into a hundred murmuring discussions throughout the room. Mary rushed up to greet me as I came down the stairs. Her face full of laughter. She shook my hand and clapped me on the back. She was the first of many, all musicians. Before I could get bogged down, Mary linked her arm in mine and led me back to my table. Good Lord, boy, man, it said. You're like a tiny king here. This isn't half the tension he usually gets, William said. Normally they still cheering when he makes it back to the table. Young woman bent their eyes and strew his path with flowers. Sim looked around the room curiously. The reaction did seem he growled for a word. Next, what is that? Because young six string here is so sharp, he can hardly help but cut himself, Stan Chin said as he made his way over to our table. You noticed that too, when it asked dryly. Hush, Mary said. It was brilliant. Stanchin sighed and shook his head. I, for one, William said pointedly, would like to know what is being discussed. Godir played the simplest song in the world and made it look like he was spinning gold out of flax, Mary said. Then he took a real piece of music, something only a handful of folk in the whole place could play, and made it look so easy you'd think a child could blow it on a tin whistle. I'm not denying that it was cleverly done, Stan Chin said. The problem is the way he did it. Everyone who jumped in clapping on the first song feels like an idiot. They feel they've been toyed with, which they were, Mary pointed out. A performer manipulates the audience. That's the point of the joke. People don't like being toyed with tension replied. They resent it, in fact. Nobody likes having a joke played on them. Technically, Simon interjected grinning. He played the Jew joke on the lute. Everyone turned to look at him, and his grin faded a bit. You see, he actually played a joke on a lute. <laughs> <laughs> he looked down at the table, <laughs> his grin fading, as his face flushed a sudden embarrassed red. Sorry, very loud and easy laugh, when it spoke up. So it's really an issue of two audiences, he said slowly. There is those that know enough about music to get the joke, and those who need that joke explained to them. Mary made a triumphant gesture toward Manet. That's it exactly, she said to Stanchian. If you come here and don't know enough to get the jug on your own, then you deserve to have your nose tweaked a bit. Except most of those people are the gentry, Stanchian said, and our clever Jack doesn't have a patron yet. What? Mary said. Trap put word out months ago. Why isn't someone snatched you up? Ambrose Jake, as I explained. Her face didn't show any recognition. You see a musician. Baron's son, William said. She gave a puzzled frown. How can you possibly keep you away from a patron? Ample free time and twice as much money as God, I said dryly. Tanrı kadar parası var diye. Ya da... Ha, bir dakika. Tanrı, bir dakika. Düşünüp geliyor. Yani o kadar çok parası var ki hepsini bir yere getirsek tanrı olur diyor o parada. Yani tanrının ki kadar demiyor. His father is one of the most powerful men in Vintas, meant Edith, then turned to Simon. What is he? 16th in line to the throne. 13th, Simon said suddenly. Entire certain family was lost at sea two months ago. Two months ago, diyoruz. Baya yakın zamanda ve Emroz'un işine geliyor falan. Bir yerde bir olayın kimin yaptığını bilmiyorsak, olayın kimin yaptığını tahmin etmek için kimin işine geldiğine bakıyoruz. Okay. 
He was once shut up about the fact that his father's barely a dozen steps from being king. When it turned back to Mary, the point is, this particular baron's son has got all manner of weight and he's not afraid to throw it around. To be completely fair, Stanchin said, it should be mentioned that young Claude is not the saviest socialite in the Commonwealth, he cleared his throat. As evidenced by tonight's performance, I hate it when people call me young Claude, I said in an aside to Sim. He gave me a sympathetic look. As to say, it was brilliant, Mary said, turning to face Stanchi and planting her feet solidly on the floor. It's the cleverest thing anyone's done here in a month, and you know it. I laid my hand on Mary's arm. He's right, I said. It was stupid. I made a vacillating shrug. But at least it would be if I still had the slightest hope of getting a patron. I looked at Stangin in the eye, but I don't. He bought no has poisoned that well for me. Wells don't stay poisoned forever, Stangin said. I shrugged. How about this then? I'd prefer to play songs that amuse my friends rather than cater to folk who dislike me based on hearsay. Stanchion drew a breath and let it out in a rush. Fair enough, he said, smiling a bit. In a brief lull that followed, Mint cleared his throat meaningfully and darted his eyes around the table. I took his hand and made a round of introductions. Stanchion, you've already met my fellow students, Will and Sim. This is Mennet, student and my sometimes mentor at the university. Everyone, this is Stanchion, host, owner, and master of the Julian's stage. Pleasure to meet you, Stanchion said, giving a polite nod before looking anxiously around the room. Speaking of hosting, I should be about my business. He patted me on the back as he turned to leave. I see if I can put out a few fires while I'm at it. I smiled my thanks to him. I made a flourishing gesture. Everyone, this is Mary, as you've already heard with your own ears, the audience's finest fiddler. As you can see with your own eyes, the most beautiful woman in a thousand miles. As we are with discerns, the wisest of, grinning, she sweated at me. If I were half as wise as I am tall, I wouldn't be stepping in to defend you. She said, has poor trap really been out stamping for you all this while? I nodded. I told him it was a lost cause. It is if you keep tamping your nose at folk, she said. I swear I've never met a man who has your neck for lack of social grace. If you weren't naturally charming, someone would have stepped you by now. You're assuming I'm muted. We return to my friends at the table. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Will not the dancing smile. Manet, however, came to his feet in a smooth motion and held out his hand. Kesinlikle benim yapmayacağım yapamayacağım bir hareket diyor. Mary took it and meant clasped it warmly between his own. Mary, he said, you intrigue me. Intrigue, böyle okunuyor sanırım. Is there any chance I could buy you a drink and enjoy the pleasure of your conversation at some point tonight? O molay bu ya. Şunu dedikten sonra her şey halloluyor var ya. I was too startled to do anything but stayed standing there. The two of them looked like badly matched bookends. Mary stood six inches taller than Manet, her boots making her long legs look even longer. Okay, Dios. Manet'tan da uzun saf alan, bu Manet'te harbili göt var, Dios. Manet, on the other hand, looked as he always did, grizzled and disheveled, plus older than Mary by at least a decade. Mary blinked and cocked her head a bit, as if considering, I'm here with some friends right now, she said. It might be late by the time I finish up with them. That makes no difference to me, Manet said easily. I'm willing to lose some sleep if it comes to that. I can't think of the last time I shared the company of a woman who speaks her mind firmly and without hesitation. Your kind are in short supply these days. Mary looked him over again. Manet met her eye and flashed a smile so confident and charming that it belonged on stage. And the desire to pull you away from your friends, he said. But you're the first fiddler in 10 years. 
Let's set my feet dancing. It seems a drink is the least I can do. Mary smiled back at him. I've amused her fry. I am on the second tire right now, she said, gesturing toward the stairway. But I should be free in, say, two hours. You're terribly kind, he said. Should I come and find you? You should, she said, and gave him a thoughtful look as she turned to walk away. Metric claimed his seat and took a drink. Lan oğlum, <laughs> lan oğlum. Simul looked as flabbergasted as we all felt. What the hell was that, he demanded. Man chuckled into his beard and leaned back in his chair, cradling his mark to his chest. That, he said smugly, is just one more thing I understand that you pups don't. Take note, take heed. Okay, <laughs> okay, kanka alıyoruz, o alıyor. When members of the nobility want to show a musician their appreciation, they give money. When I first began playing in the Yulian, I did see the few such gifts, and for a time it had been enough to have pay my tuition and keep my head above water, if only barely. But Emrose had been persistent in his campaign against me, and it had been months since I had received anything of the sort. Musicians are poorer than the gentry, but they still enjoy a show. So when they appreciate your playing, they buy you drinks. That was the real reason I was at the Eolian tonight. Mint wandered off to fetch a wet rag from the bar so we could clean the table and play another round of corners. Before he could make it back, a young sealish piper came over to ask if there was any chance he could stand us around. There was a chance, as it turned out. He caught the eye of a nearby serving girl, and we each ordered what we liked best, and a beer for a minute besides. We drank, played cards, and listened to music. Minute and I had a run of bad cards and went down three hands in a row. It soothed my mood a bit, but not nearly as much as the sneaking suspicion that Stanchi might be right about what he'd said. A rich patron would solve many of my problems, if the poor patron would be able to give me a little room to breathe. Financially speaking, if nothing else, and if the shade of our patron olursa, fakirliğini dürüst bir şekilde söylemesi de sorun değil. Çünkü patron olayı zaten müzisyene yardım etmek falan. Bu açıdan bayağı bir rahatlatır diyoruz. If nothing else, it would give me someone I could borrow money from in a tight spot rather than being forced into dealing with dangerous folk. While my mind was occupied, I misplayed and we lost another hand, putting us down four in a row with a four feet besides. Then it glared at me while he gathered in the cars. Here's a primer for admissions. He held up his hand, three fingers peering angrily into the ear. Let's say you have three spades in your hand, and there have been five spades laid down. He held up his other hand, fingers splayed wide. How many spades is that total? He leaned back in his chair, crossing his arms. Take your time. Bayağı bir sinirlenmiş diyoruz. He's still reeling from the knowledge that Mary is willing to have a drink with you, William said dryly. We all are. Not me, Simon Church. I knew you had it in you. We were interrupted by the arrival of Lily, one of the regular serving girls at the Yulian. What's going on here, she said playfully. Is someone throwing a handsome party? Lily Simon asked, if I ask you to have a drink with me, would you consider it? I will, she said easily, but not for very long. She laid her hand on his shoulder. You gents are in luck. An anonymous admirer of fine music has offered to stand your table a round of drinks. Scotton for me, William said. Mead Simon said, Greeny, I'll have a Santon, I said. Went raise an eyebrow, a Santon, eh? He asked, glancing at me. I have one too. He gave the serving girl a knowing look and nodded toward me. On his, of course. Really, it is said and shrugged, making a shake. Now that you've impressed the hell out of everyone, you can have some fun, right? Simon asked, something about a donkey. 
for the last time, no, I said, I'm done with Ambrose. There's no percentage in antagonizing him any further. You broke his arm, Will said. I think he's as antagonized as he is going to get. He broke my loot, I said. We're even. I'm ready to let bygones be bygones. Like hell, Sim said. You dropped that pound of rancid butter down his chimney. You loosened the cinch on his saddle. Black hands shut up, I said, looking around. That was nearly a month ago, and no one knows it was me except for you two. And now menace, and everyone with an earshot. Sim flushed and embarrassed red and the conversation lulled until Lily returned with our drinks. This cotton was in its traditional stone cup. Seems meat shone golden in a tall glass. Matt and I got wooden marks. Matt smiled. I can't remember the last time I ordered a something he mused. I don't think I've ever ordered one for myself before. You're the only other person I've ever known to drink, it seems said. Got here, throws them back like nobody's business, three or four a night. Matt raised a bushy eyebrow with me. They don't know. They don't know, he asked. I shook my head as I drank out of my own mug. Not sure if I should be amused or embarrassed. Ben slid his mug toward Simon, who picked it up and took a sip. He frowned and took another water. Ben nodded. It's an old horse trick. You're chatting them up in the tap room of the brother, and you want to show you're not like all the rest. You're a man of refinement, so you offered to buy a drink. He reached across the table and took his mark back from Sim. But they're working, they don't want a drink, they'd rather have the money, so they order a something or a pepperet or something else. You pay your money, the barman gives her water, and at the end of the night, she splits the money with the house. If she's a good listener, a girl can make as much at the bar as she does in bed. I chimed in. Actually, we split it three ways. A third to the house, a third to the barman, and a third to me. We're getting screwed, damn, and I said, frankly, the barman should get his piece from the house. i never seen you order a son at Anchor, Sim said. It must be the greatest day of meat, Will said. You order that all the time. But I have ordered Grace Dale, Sim protested. It tasted like sweet pickles and peas. Besides, Sim trade off. It was more expensive than you thought it would be when it asked Greeny. Would it make much sense to go through all of this for the price of a short beer? Would it? They know what I mean when I order Grace Dale at Anchors, I told him. If I ordered something that didn't actually exist, it would be a pretty easy game to figure out. How do you know about this? Him asked Menard. Menard chuckled. No new tricks to an old dog like me, he said. The lights began to dim and we turned the tower to the stage. The night rambled on from there. We left for greener pastures while we, Sim and I, and did, and I, and did our best to keep our table clear of glasses. Our amused musicians bought us round after round of drinks. An obscene amount of drinks, really, far more than I dared to hope for. I drank something for the most part, since raising money to cover tuition was the main reason I'd come to the Eulian tonight. But then Sim ordered a few rounds too, now that they knew the trick of it. I was doubly grateful, otherwise I would have been forced to bring them home in a real barrel. Eventually, the three of us had our fill of music, gossip, and, in Sim's case, the fruitless pursuit of serving girls. Before we left, I stopped to have a discreet word with the barman, where I brought up the difference between a half and a third. At the end of our negotiation, I cashed out for a full talent and a six jobs. The vast majority of that was from the drinks my fellow musicians had bought me tonight. I gathered the coins into my purse, three talents even. My negotiations had also profited me two dark brown butters, but that seemed asked as I began to tuck the butters into my loot case. Bread and beer, I shifted the racks I used 
to pad my loot so they wouldn't rub against it. Braden will said his voice thick with disdain is closer to bread than beer. Sim nodded in agreement, making a face. I don't like having to chew my liquor. It's not that bad, I said defensively. In a small kingdom's woman drink it when they're pregnant. I will mention it in one of his lectures. They brew it with flower pollen and fish oil and cherry stones. It has all sorts of trace nutrients. Quote, we don't judge you. William lay his hand on my shoulder, his face concerned. Sim and I don't mind that we are a pregnant Irish woman. Sim snorted, then laughed at the fact that he had snorted. The three of us made our slow way back to the university, crossing the high arc of Stone Bridge. And since there was nobody around to hear, I sang Jackass, Jackass for Sim. It has Sims tumbled gently off to their rooms in Muse, but I wasn't ready for bed and continued wandering the university's empty streets, breathing the cool night air. I strode past the dark fronts of apothecaries, glass blowers, and book binders. I cut through a manicured lawn, smelling the clean, dusty smell of autumn leaves and green grass beneath. Nearly all the inns and drinking houses were dark, but lights were burning in the brothels. The gray stone of the master's hall was silvery in the moonlight. A single dim light burned inside, illuminating the stained glass window that showed Tecamini's classic pulse, Socrates Diaz, barefoot at the mouth of his cave, speaking to a crowd of young students. I the Confucius gestured for Amolia. Not sure. I went past the crucible, its countless bristling chimneys dark and largely smokeless against the moonlit sky. Even at night, it smelled of ammonia and cherried flowers, acid and alcohol, a thousand mingled scents that had seeped into the stone of the building over the centuries. Thus was the archives. Five stories tall and windowless, it reminded me of an enormous waste tone. Its massive doors were closed, but I could see the reddish light of sympathy lamps wailing up around the edges of the door. During admissions, Master Loring kept the archives open at night so all the members of the Arcanum could study to their hearts' content. All members except one, of course. I made my way back to anchors and found the inn dark and silent. I had a key to the back door, but rather than stumble through the dark, I headed into the nearby LD, right foot rain barrel, left foot window of ledge, left hand iron drain pipe. I quietly made my way up to my third story window, tripped the ledge with a piece of wire and let myself in. It was pitch black, and I was too tired to go looking for a light from the fireplace downstairs. So I touched the wick of the lamp beside my bed, getting a little oil on my fingers. Then I murmured a binding and felt my arm go chilly as the heat bled out of it. Nothing happened at first, and I scowled, concentrating to overcome the vague haze of alcohol. The chill sunk deeper into my arm, making me shiver, but finally the wick bloomed into light. Cold now, I closed the window and looked around the tiny room with its slot ceiling and narrow bed. Surprisingly, I realized there was nowhere else in the four corners I'd rather be. I almost felt as if I were home. This may not seem odd to you, but it was strange to me. Growing up among the Adama Roo, home was ne never a place for me. Home was a group of vegans and songs around a campfire. When my troop was killed, it was more than the loss of my family and childhood friends. It was like my entire world had been burned down to the waterline. Now, uh, now, after almost a year at the university, I was beginning to feel like I belonged here. It was an odd feeling, this fondness for a place. In some ways, it was comforting, but the ruh in me was restless, 
He believed that the thought of putting down roots like a plant. As I drifted off to sleep, I wondered what my father would think of me. Okay, diyoruz. Chapter 7 demiş, admissions. Kapadan önce diyecek bir şey var mı? Düşünüp geliyorum. Nope, hadi görüşürüz.